Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to tonight's MHPM webinar on psychological treatments for trichotillomania. Uh, we have about 400 people logged in from all over Australia. Welcome, everybody. Um, and also, there will be a number of people who will watch this later on the podcast as well. Um, our uh, conference support people, Redback, will post numbers into the general chat tab. Actually, I think that's for me. So every now and again, I'm going to give you an update on how many people are in the webinar. But so far, it's around 400. Welcome to you all. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respect to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. My name is Mary Emily and I am a GP by background and a psychotherapist and now I'm a second year psychiatry trainee. Based in Cairns, I've been in North Queensland for 20 years, so my pretty much my whole working career. Um, and I have had the privilege of facilitating quite a number of MHPM webinars and really enjoy meeting interesting panellists. And also it's very interesting to, um, to see the discussions between the participants as well. And I know that you teach each other a lot um, during the sessions as well. The purpose of the webinar is to give health professionals the skills they need so that they can help people more effectively in the future. Personal stories of illness are very important and the MHPN does often include consumers and carers on our panels. The chat box, however, is not a forum for personal stories. It is designed to complement the panel discussion by allowing professionals to share resources and their experiences of practice. Thank you for respecting that. And remember that if any of the content in tonight's webinars um, does cause you personal distress, please seek care if you require it. Beyond Blues on 1300 224636 or you can contact your GP or local mental health service. Now the panellists' um, bios were disseminated beforehand and hopefully you will had a chance to read them. But I'd like to just introduce each person briefly. So in no particular order, uh, Johanna. Welcome. Now you are a GP yourself. You do have a particular interest in complex trauma and I know that you're doing yes. a PhD at the moment. I just wondered if you could in about two sentences or less just give us a little idea about your PhD topic. Yes, I'm in my third year of researching primary care approaches to distress um, using a framework of sense of safety. Um, and uh, there's been a process of inquiring of stakeholders and international academics to form a new way for GPs to think about the whole person, including their, their life story and their experiences. Um, so I'll be showing a little bit of that in our time talking today. Now, Scott, I, you are, I believe, in Melbourne and you're a psychiatrist. Um, I was yes. just wondering if you'd like to just tell us a little bit about what Melbourne's like today and also about your practice. Um, Melbourne's very hot today. We're, uh, we're expecting, uh, I think, 40 degrees again tomorrow. So uh, it'll be uh, a good day to stay inside and not be uh, doing too much out. Um, I, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I've been practicing for a while, but I've, I've always had my main interest in anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, and uh, trichotillomania sort of in relation to that. So, uh, and I do, I, I treat people with both pills and with CBT stuff. So, um, there's, yeah, look, uh, there's a huge demand for combination treatments and, uh, and so I'm uh, snowed under basically. Well, it's fantastic for us to have you on our panel tonight with your expertise. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you. Imogen, you're a clinical psychology registrar. I understand you're just about to get your letters. Um, and, I, and you have done a PhD specifically around trichotillomania. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I did my um, PhD in clinical psychology at Swinburne, um, finished that off mid-2016 and I focused on uh, trichotillomania specifically in that research. So um, trying to understand if there are 
particular thoughts or thinking styles that contribute to hair pulling episodes um, in these people. So yeah, I've got a soft spot for learning about trichotillomania um, and I really enjoy working with, with people who have trick and related problems. Thank you. And I must admit, I hadn't heard just the abbreviation trick until yes. we had our panel preparation. So we're already learning something. Thank you very much, Imogen, and welcome. Just a few housekeeping things. Um, remembering that this is similar to a live audience. It is a live audience. So anything that you type into the chat box um, to our participants, don't say things that you wouldn't say in a public setting. So, um, and also please try and keep your comments on topic. And remember that if you post your technical, if you have a technical issue, pop it into the technical support FAQ tab and then there's a technical support. Um, you can phone the hotline if you don't find your answer there. But don't type your technical questions into the general chat because they may not see it. Um, and if there is a significant technical issue that affects everybody, you will be alerted via an announcement and um, you'll be advised what to do. So that very rarely happens. A couple of times it has and we've been able to sort things out and, and get it going. And if you're watching it later on, you probably won't even notice things like that. Um, so you also had a chance to read the case study beforehand and through the, our exploration of the case study and our topic, we're going to hopefully by the end of it be able to describe the common symptoms and causes of trichotillomania, identify suitable medications and psychological therapies to reduce symptoms of trichotillomania and identify best practice for referrals and psychological care for people living with trichotillomania. And this is in the context of our multidisciplinary team discussion. Just a note there on that slide to point out the supporting resources in the library tab at the bottom right of your screen. You'll see a little folder icon down there. Now I would like, first of all, so that the way that tonight will be is that each of our um, presenters is going to respond to Hannah, who's the young woman who has um, presented to her GP in the way that they would think about it from their professional chair. Just to let you know that there are 550 people logged in now and I would like to um, now invite Johanna. So Redback, if you could just unmute Jo and um, she's going to talk to us about her response to Hannah who comes to see her as a patient with this probably tricky problem. Thank, and that wasn't meant to be a pun, I just realised. Welcome Jo. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm speaking as a GP, um, I'm focusing on the patient and less on her behaviour and the long name we have for that behaviour. Um, as Scott and Imogen who have more specific knowledge will address um, those areas. Um, my um, talk will focus mostly on the task of holding the whole, attending to the relationships that Hannah has with herself, um, with other people and with her world and attending to the breadth as well as depth of information that might be relevant. When I was preparing this I thought you know, there's sort of four main um, tasks and one um, slide I'm going to present of my hopes for Hannah. Um, my tasks are um, what broad areas of knowledge do I need in order to make a diagnosis? Um, what parts of the story am I currently missing? What processes are being enacted as part of this consultation and what kind of responses am I having to Hannah um, and, and the way this story is being told? So I thought the holding the whole in mind, um, you know, what do I need in order to make a diagnosis? Um, the word dia means thorough or complete and gnosis is knowledge and so those, um, that word is really important for the generalist as, as holding that whole. And so I put there the areas of the whole that are important for the generalist to consider. Um, and I thought I'd focus a little bit in Hannah's case on uh, relationships. Um, all of those areas affect health and well-being. Um, in her relationships, I'm, I'm really interested in the availability of people in her life, their attunement to her. Is there anybody in her life that can help her calm herself down? Um, their responsiveness um, over her lifetime, how has she been responded to? Is there anyone who really got her and knows how to calm her? Um, who can she trust? Um, you know, can she tell her friends about her worries or disclose her deepest distress to anyone? 
Um, and then boundaries. Um, is there anyone who invades her space um, emotionally or physically or distances um, from her? Um, and then the other thought I'd focus on is her sense of self. I'm really interested in what her attitude towards herself is when she makes a mistake. Um, does she have a compassionate relationship with herself? Can she tolerate strong emotions and calm herself down? And what sorts of things improve her sense of self? Um, and uh, you know, I see in there that sometimes I'd go across to some of the, the questioning that we use from the positive psychology, thinking about PERMA, the positive relationships and engagement, um, emotions and meaning and, and an accomplishment that she might have in her life. So looking for her strengths as well. Um, and then she may have spiritual distress and he, um, or have some sense of purpose and meaning. Those things sometimes help us to focus on what really matters to her. And the second um, question I ask is, um, what parts of Hannah's story am I currently missing? And in her case, I really notice um, that um, you know, I'm not really sure what's going on in her family. I'm not really sure where dad is or what happened in her relationship with her boyfriend. Um, I'm not sure what's going on in her mind or her heart just before she feels like um, pulling her hair, what sort of trigger thoughts um, that she might be having. And I'm not really sure what she feels towards herself, um, what she loves doing, what she's good at, um, what, what her, how, how connected she feels to herself. So those are areas I think I'm missing in the story so far. Um, and then if I look at the process of what processes are going on in this story, I see that Hannah's ambivalent. Her mum's the one bringing her for help. Um, she seems reluctant to visit the GP and reluctant to do what's suggested. And she seems a little disconnected from people in this story. I notice she's not paying much attention to herself. Um, she's minimizing consequences and really not engaged in her own self-care. Uh, and she's using behavior to manage her stress. Um, and I notice there's patches of knowledge that are missing, what key elements of the history that are missing. Um, and um, her, the incoherence of her story of, uh, is something that has bothered me. So if I look at my responses to um, this uh, situation, I see that I'm struck by the incoherence of her self-harming behavior when the, what talked about is that the loss of relationship with her boyfriend as being no apparent reason. It just doesn't make sense to me. So my response is I'm not convinced something's missing. Um, I'm noticing this absence of connection um, with herself, with her body, with others, with her GP. And I'm getting a sense of helplessness as her symptoms worsen. I feel that in her mother and in Hannah. Um, and then I'm struck by the passive role she's playing in her own healing and the active role she's playing in her hair pulling. And I'm wondering if we, we could engage that active energy um, to help her rather than hinder her. So my last slide is my hopes for Hannah. I feel I, I want her to be safe in her own environment, increase her connection to past supportive relationships, find ways to increase her play and interactive interaction with people, um, help her to use her body to calm herself through mindful grounding, awareness of her sensations, beauty, music, creativity, all those things. Um, to help her to tolerate uncomfortable feelings, um, to understand things that get distorted and her need to sometimes escape into repetitive behaviors to numb or dissociate. And I'd love for her to increase her self-compassion and the sense of inner unity so she can befriend herself in this story and look after herself. Uh, and to help her make sense of what happened to her at 14 and in her recent relationship um, to find a sense of purpose and hope and connect her to any resources she may have. Um, so that's my hopes for Hannah and I look forward to hearing the rest of the story from the others. Thanks Joe. that's really comprehensive and I, I know that um, particularly the first slide there about the, and the idea of gnosis and whole knowing was really helpful and I think um, it made me think about the kinds of things that as a GP you're, you are actually thinking about all of those areas but I've never seen them so well defined. So I'll be using that slide as a resource. Um, that's I'm my PhD sure so be careful. <laughs> so that, that, that's bits of my PhD that I'm sharing there. So, so um, I, I would say that um, 
a lot of our participants are going to find that really useful too. So just once again a reminder about the resource library in the bottom corner there. So the slides will be available afterwards. Um, now the other thing is that there's now over 600 people, nearly 700 logged in. Uh, so in the case of Hannah, what happened was she went to her GP and then um, she, the GP knew that psychological therapy would be helpful and encouraged her to see a psychologist. She didn't want to because she felt it hadn't been helpful at 16, but the GP has supported her to try it again. Um, and so, oh, I'm absolutely sorry. <laughs> what we did in this case, because um, we have such an expert psychologist, in this case, Hannah is going to go and see the psychiatrist first um, because in actual fact having a psychologist as expert as Imogen is uh, unusual. So in this case Scott knows Imogen through his professional network and interest in trichotillomania. So first of all we're going to go and see the psychiatrist and see how he might think about Hannah. Thanks very much Scott. Okay, thanks Mary. Um, yeah, look, jo Joanna's focused on a range of the broad psychological issues and I should say before we get on to the, the um, specific stuff about trick, is that there's a lot there and I think um, many people could end up getting treatment for those issues, the anxiety and depression issues there um, and before doing any work on trichotillomania. But uh, anyway, we, we, we're going to be specific on trick for a little while now, uh, at least for the next few minutes. So these are the characteristics um, that uh, we see. Um, so some of this is, is just basic sort of diagnostic stuff, repetitive hair pulling to the point of noticeable loss or functional impairment. Um, a number of people um, get, a, get a feeling of tension which they need to relieve. Um, many don't. Um, the, it's much more common in females than males. Um, it's got this chronic waxing and waning course which is pretty characteristic of most um, OCD, anxiety, impulse control disorders. Um, starts around 13 or a little earlier in a lot of cases. Um, it, it probably needs to be noted that there are a lot of um, really young kids who, who develop some hair pulling, you know, much younger than this, um, where it appears fairly briefly and then tends to disappear. So um, I have a lot of people who come in and say, my kids just started pulling hair um, and I say, well, look, we need to be aware of that, but that isn't necessarily a long-term issue at this stage. Um, the impairment relates to damage to the hair and the skin and also to ingestion. A lot of people will play with the hair after they, they pull it, they'll often eat it as well and that can lead to hairballs and related issues there. Um, the big issue um, really though is psychosocial impairment um, and psychiatric comorbidity in particular. Um, but as you can imagine it has effects in a whole range of other areas as well. So let me go on. So this is, this is a simple model for understanding it. Um, in essence, there are people who do what we call focus pulling, where the event is preceded by some sort of private internal event. So they get an urge, uh, they might get a bodily sensation, sometimes a tingle in their hair. Um, for some people, it's an oiliness in their hair. Um, for some, it's just a physical awareness. Emotions are important. Boredom is a classic one, and stress, of course, and cognition. You know, I need to pull. I can't cope without pulling. Um, so that's the focus side of things. But there's also another group of people, and often people do a bit of both. So people will um, be, uh, do the focus pulling, but they also do automatic pulling. And this is almost where they're not entirely aware of it. And people will say, you know, I, I found out I was pulling because I, I looked on the floor and I noticed that there was a whole pile of hairs on the floor, which I don't even fully remember pulling out. Um, so one of the things we're looking at here is those private experiences and that relates a bit to what Johanna said before about trying to understand the, the sort of the, the process and, and the thinking that goes through people's heads when they're, um, when they're pulling or when they're about to pull. Um, now I like the um, ACT enhanced behaviour therapy of trichotillomania. 
Um, it's a manualized treatment. Um, you can the, the references are in the in the library at the end if you want to have a look at them. Um, they present sort of a nice description both for the therapist and for the patient. Um, and there's a it's a workbook approach, and you can go through it if you want to. Um, and you can go through it as quickly or as slowly as you wish. Um, essentially, it's a combination of uh, habit reversal training, stimulus control, and some ACT ideas for the more focused pulling. And um, Imogen's going to talk a lot more about the specifics there. So we want to teach people to be aware of their pulling and when they do it, uh, in what circumstances, etc. We want to give them self-management strategies to, to stop that. Um, and the ACT ideas look at things like diffusion and acceptance, trying to get people to get better at just handling that feeling and that urge that they feel like they must respond to. Um, the term experiential avoidance is relevant here, and that's a real ACT idea, which I think has some, a lot of relevance here. The next bit, I guess, is, is I guess the psychiatry issue, and it's quite relevant in this case. Uh, this, this woman. Um, has obviously preceding issues with anxiety and depression, and I think from reading the case, or is already on uh, medications and has received some treatment. Um, in essence, most people with trichotillomania have psychiatric comorbidities. Um, depression is the, probably the most important. Um, OCD is extremely common. Um, other anxiety disorders, social anxiety, is is always a big issue, and I always get people to be aware of of social anxiety, it's absolutely relevant for these people. It's relate, it relates a bit to her and her issues with the wig. Um, substance use and eating disorders sometimes. But what I've written down the bottom there is probably more important. These people have lots of issues with shame, guilt, disgust. Um, and in fact, that's really the thing that, that, that causes their depression or is a huge motivating continuing factor in them being depressed. Um, and that's really important. And so finally, medication treatment. Now, most commonly, the people I see are already on medications in most cases. And I've got to say that the evidence for, for pills in trichotillomania is actually pretty poor. Um, there have been a few randomized controlled trials. Um, the, the results are just average at best. Um, this is again controlling for depression. Uh, obviously, when people are depressed, you're going to get a better response, I think, um, and that may improve things. But in essence, um, behaviour therapy is the treatment. Um, and if you do it in combination with medications, that's fine. Um, but they, they, if they have significant trick, they must get onto some sort of CBT behaviour therapy approach. And uh, Imogen's going to discuss this in a bit more detail in a sec. Um, the research says that um, some antidepressants, SSRIs and clonipramine, which is an older tricyclic antidepressant, um, can be helpful. Look, a range of other pills have been used, and I've listed some down the bottom there. None of those would be first choice uh, uh, options, or even maybe second or third choices. Um, and they're all, you know, sort of the evidence for, it, for all of them is is a bit scanty, really. So um, whilst pills are perhaps important, it's the specific behavioural stuff that's probably more important. And that's all for me. Thanks very much, Scott. That was really helpful. And I, I, one of the things you mentioned was that you sometimes, see, or not uncommonly, can see hair pulling in much, much younger children. And it was interesting that you said it often goes away. So we, we might come back and talk about that in the um, discussion if we have time, but I just wanted to acknowledge that because it was one of the questions that quite a few people had put in at registration was yeah. about when it occurs in much younger kids. So we'll come back to that if we have time. Thanks very much. And um, if we go back to thinking about Hannah, so she's been to see um, Scott and he's recommended that she really does need psychological therapy, confirming what the GP recommended. Um, and has referred her off to see Imogen. Uh, welcome, Imogen. All right, thanks very much. It's um, yeah, a lovely place to move on from. So um, essentially, from my perspective, um, 
I would be starting out again with validating um, that this is a really difficult condition to live with. There can be a lot of ambivalence around whether you want to work on this um, hair pulling problem or um, maybe try to avoid it entirely, which might be the case for where Hannah might be feeling. Um, and one thing that can sort of help clients to realise that this behaviour doesn't sort of come out of nowhere and it's not weird or random is actually conducting a really comprehensive assessment. So for us psychologists, it's really back to the, the basic sort of classical and operant conditioning principles. Um, this is a common model um, for how we understand um, some of the factors that contribute to this hair pulling cycle being quite difficult to break. So um, we've got a, a basic sort of behavioural model here where there's a conditioned cue. Maybe um, we're really just trying to help Hannah figure out what are these conditioned cues which are constantly sort of eliciting that, that trigger to start pulling, whether it's maybe she sees or feels a particular hair and that then elicits an urge to pull. Maybe there's some facilitative or inhibitive factors as well that might contribute to whether she, she does go on to pull or maybe stops herself in the moment. Um, so these can be things like being um, you know, alone at home, there's no one else around, um, being quite sort of sedentary, um, sitting certain postures on the couch so that your hand's already up near your hair. Um, the hair pulling behaviours themselves can be quite reinforcing. So things like you know, touching the hair with your face, um, playing with it, feeling the texture, it can actually be quite nice and enjoyable. Pulling out hair um, a lot of the time is described as um, generating quite a lot of pleasure and gratification and actually not too painful. So this can be another factor that contributes to why it's so um, ingrained. And then we've got these consequences too where it sort of facilitates a sense of relaxation, um, facilitating a bit of a sense of being in a trance where you sort of feel a bit dissociated and it's a bit kind of warm and cosy and you're not thinking about everything else that's going on in your life. But it can also get to a point too where um, because people can sit pulling um, in awkward positions with their bodies for several minutes to even um, hours, Maybe sometimes that pain in muscle joints can come in, um, pain in the fingers, that sort of thing. And at that moment, maybe the hair pulling episode stops or maybe there's an appointment that the person needs to go to and they sort of stop then and there to move on to a different task. So during the initial stages um, of working with a person with TRIC, I like to conduct this really comprehensive functional analysis using a behavioural model to really pinpoint what are the factors that are um, kind of leading up to, during and after the hair pulling cycle. And we can break them down into the sensory, cognitive, affect or emotional, motor or behavioural and playful, situational or environmental based factors too. So making the acronym SCAMP which is quite nice. So as part of doing this, I guess your own sort of functional analysis along with Hannah, the next um, really important stage of um, treatment is um, to do a lot of self-monitoring um, and I really try to encourage this from, from the get-go. So you can use your standard sort of self-monitoring forms and maybe tweak them to sort of capture those elements of the sensory, cognitive, affect, motor and place-based factors that might be contributing to this hair pulling cycle. Some clients can be quite resistant to, to self-monitoring um, and others find it quite enlightening. So it can be important to find ways of getting people to engage in this task as it's, it's critical to improve that awareness and understanding of, of what's contributing to this behaviour but also helping people to see that it's not coming out of nowhere. Um, there's predictable systematic situations in this person's life that um, make hair pulling more or less likely to occur and so we can enhance um, situations that are you know more more likely for the person to not engage in pulling um, as one sort of strategy. So Scott touched on this before in terms of some of the, I guess, uh, habit reversal therapies that are enhanced with these cognitive approaches. And the two evidence-based approaches for this augmentation are ACT and DBT. And like Scott, I take more of an ACT-based approach with my clients personally. But common to all of these um, evidence-based treatments for TRIC. We've basically got psychoeducation, self-monitoring and awareness training as I was saying before which are really important. 
competing response training, stimulus control, and then you've got some of your emotion regulation, distress tolerance techniques, and values and motivational strategies. So I'm going to focus on um, three key aspects of habit reversal therapy here. Each of these needs to be collaborative. We need to be inviting our clients to um, think about what's going to be useful to them, what helps them, um, what sounds like it could be reasonable for them to, to work on. If they think something won't be helpful or um, they've tried it before and it was completely useless, then that may not be our best bet to try and, and go for it. The other thing to note with these strategies is um, using them on their own for a couple of days will get you nowhere. The more likely um, that you kind of engage all of these strategies um, together and in a very focused and systematic way, you'll have more success with that. So I've already talked about awareness training, competing response. Um, that can be simple things like when you feel that urge um, come on to pull your hair, maybe clench your fist, fold your arms, do something that's incompatible, physically incompatible with hair pulling for one minute. And preferably it should be socially discreet, um, it's easy to do. And then the stimulus control strategies here as well, they're also really crucial. Um, three key principles there for stimulus control, um, they should make pulling more effortful. They should be relatively easy to do, um, simple. And um, the purpose of stimulus control isn't to prevent or entirely avoid uncomfortable experiences, but actually to control the stimuli that contribute to the likelihood of um, engaging in hair pulling. So you're not trying to control the behavior itself, just the factors that contribute to that behavior occurring. So monitoring progress, that's another thing that um, is really important and we do have um, a few resources which um, I believe I've also kind of pointed out how to find those in the resources library to help you track change over time, which is quite important for helping um, you know, someone like Hannah to see that, hey, things are shifting. Um, if this doesn't have to be forever and any progress, no matter how small, is, is really important but also for you know, liaising back with your GP and your psychiatrist about how things are going. Um, again, collaborate with your client about the best way for keeping up that self-monitoring, um, that progress reporting, so whether using smartphone apps or, or technology could be useful. Trying to make it as easy and relevant to them as possible and problem solving around barriers to homework, treatment strategies, that sort of thing. And finally, um, I really want to impress the importance of, of psychoeducation, normalizing empathy, validation, um, hearing Hannah's story. Um, again, reinforcing that this behavior, it, it's, it's not just this random weird thing. Um, she's not alone. It's actually a lot more common than we think. Um, and hair pulling sort of it ranges on a, a dimension from, you know, everyone does it to remove an, an annoying gray hair, for example right through to that more severe spectrum. So we can think of hair pulling as serving a purpose. And for some people, it, it, it can become a bit um, out of control and harder to manage. Treatment goals need to be realistic as well. Um, clients may come in expecting that things will change immediately and that may not be um, realistic um, or that they will be pull free after a few sessions. And it's also important as well to be looking after yourself, um, looking, yeah, that sort of self-care behaviours and, and sort of working on any comorbid conditions like depression and anxiety as well as Scott was saying. Um, so I think that's it for me and yeah, perhaps we move on. Thank you Imogen, that's really helpful and I, the audience are really um, very active in the chat box and really getting a lot out of the panel's contributions so far. There's 744 participants which is great. Um, I'll just keep you there, Image, and I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions that have been coming in. Um, mm -hmm. So you mentioned there that someone might have had this for more than 10 years. So one of the, mm -hmm. there's been a couple of things. So, so some people have said, look, I've been practicing for 30 years and I've only ever seen one person with trick. I guess it's possible that people may feel so ashamed that they just don't yeah. acknowledge it and that would maybe be common, I'm wondering. And then my other question is about do eyelashes count? Yeah, so yeah, I'll, um, eyelashes count, yes. Um, so hair can be pulled from anywhere 
from the body. Most commonly, um, it affects women, and most commonly, they'll be pulling hair from the scalp, the eyelashes, and the eyebrows. Um, not necessarily all three. Um, but people can also pull hair from um, like their arms and legs, and even even their pubic region. Um, and you know, there might be sort of you know, beauty products and, and, you know, cosmetic standards even that sort of say, hey, just remove that bodily hair, no problem. But what I found is um, it's that sort of that urge and that desire which feels really uncontrollable to actually pull hair from areas like the pubic region that some clients can feel quite a lot of shame about, that sort of sense of, you know, why am I so compelled to be pulling hair from those areas? That's a bit strange. Am I the only one who does this? And I guess it sort of ties in with that second uh, sorry, that first question um, around, I guess, the, the rarity of seeing this in practice. Um, one thing that I've heard from my own clients and research participants is they might sort of um, go online to find information about this and it's online that they sort of discover that this, this problem has a name. Um, and they'll find sort of internet-based peer support communities and, and information and that sort of thing. And for some people that can be enough and that can be quite validating and, and helpful. Um, and for others it might sort of spur them on to, to check in with their GP. And then they might hit another barrier where their health professional is just a bit unsure of what this is and doesn't know what to do or who to refer to. And at that point that can be another barrier to preventing that person from going on from their GP to seeing the psychiatrist or a psychologist. Um, but it, it is more prevalent than we think. So um, there's been a little bit of research um, across uh, the US and uh, yeah, there was a study recently in Australia actually. So prevalence roughly is about 2 to 4%, which is a lot higher than you might expect. Um, but then again, of that proportion who are seeing you know, their health professionals to work on this um, it's you know we're not too sure, but I imagine it would be a lot lower because of that low awareness and the shame and stigma. Thank you, Imogen. Um, I know that George had something else to add um, on the comment of the different kinds of behaviours that can be part of this. So um, did I say Scott then or George? I'm very. You sorry. said George. My cousin George is a, is a shrink in Brisbane, so you you probably know him better than me. But anyway, thanks, um, Scott. Look, that's no problem. Uh, <laughs> yeah, look, I was going to make a couple of quick comments. One, um, the rarity issue is is, is important because um, I agree uh, with Imogen. It actually reflects more the issues relating to shame and and, and guilt and the wish to avoid things. Um, my main sort of treatment interest is OCD, and 40 years ago, OCD was seen as an extremely rare condition. And it wasn't at all. I mean, we know that OCD occurs in about 2% of the population. And it was rare because people didn't go to see doctors because um, they thought, well, firstly, they thought that doctors didn't know what they were doing and they didn't have any treatment for it. And secondly, they thought that um, they'd be seen as crazy and tossed in, into um, a psych hospital. Now, OCD has come a long way. And I think um, you know this has happened with a lot of psychiatric conditions in the last sort of 10, 20 years. And, I suspect it'll happen here with 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 Trick as well. Um, the other issue um, that I just wanted to pop in is that um, there's a whole range of other sort of impulsive conditions that are sometimes associated. Skin picking is the obvious one, um, and this can be pretty severe and bad in a lot of cases. Um, but there's also other things, nail biting as well. Again, probably more often in younger uh, children. So. Uh, these sort of things all tend to go a bit together and I think currently in our latest um, classification system, DSM-5, they're all related, they're all described as uh, OCD related disorders. So they're all somewhat linked with OCD. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, I, I just had a question. I'm going to bring, we'll come back to you in a minute. I just wanted to bring Jo in. I, there was a question from the audience that I thought was really interesting uh, about um, seeing someone who has actually had this for 40 years and has only just told their health practitioner now. And I, th I think that that sometimes happens to GPs, that people eventually get to know you and feel comfortable enough and safe enough to talk about something 
really difficult. And I wondered how, yeah. as a GP, I mean, it's, it is a thing that can happen with lots of issues, but if Hannah was in her 50s and this had been going on for a long, long time and she told you as her GP, would your approach be any different and do you think that, that you can actually do anything after 40 years? Ah, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Because I, I think it's a question we come across with lots of compulsive behaviours where people have habit formed, almost grown up maybe with that as their main way of coping with internal distress and, and learning new ways of doing that is harder. Um, I think after you've been doing it for longer, I'd love to know what Scott and Imogen think about that. Um, you know, I guess I'd be thinking um, if someone finally revealed it, um, that something had happened to make it safe enough for them to show show that part of themselves to me as a clinician. Um, I'd, I'd be sort of sensing probably that I'd, there'd been a sense of building the space for them um, because there'd be other signs in their life that they've got thing, you know, things that might be causing shame. Um, and so sort of creating a space where they felt free to, to show that particular behaviour um, and not feel they were going to be judged for it. Um, and, you know, I think that's part of what we've been talking about today is really normalising all, you know, all of our coping mechanisms as, as sort of logical, rational responses, defences almost, or ways to make ourselves feel safer um, that, that happen across all the different kinds of ways we get compelled. Um, including some of the, you know, really, you know, more socially acceptable things like over-exercising or um, um, uh, other forms of um, ways that we manage our moods in, in our community. So I guess I'd be thinking I'd want to hold out hope. Um, something's changed. She's told us something new. Um, there's always hope when something new gets uh, shifted. Um, but I'd also be a little bit wary of um, expecting too much from her and more wanting to see what else in their life, can, what, what else can we do to decrease shame um, in all the areas of their life um, that, that will provide a sort of place where they could learn something new as well. Shame often prevents learning. Um, it prevents us feeling safe enough to take in something new. Um, and so I'd be thinking of a very broad way, including relationships, relationship to their self, relationship to their world, um, that would help shift this situation for them if they want it moved. Thank you. That's really helpful and you know it's a, um, a really the practical kinds of things that um, that's the reason we attend these webinars is because we will have to just deal with whatever comes in the door. Um, and yeah. I also I didn't acknowledge earlier but we do have lots of clinicians from regional and remote centres as well and it's fantastic to have you here. So I guess we also need to be thinking about we don't all have a Scott and an Imogen in the next suburb and so it's fantastic to share their expertise and be able to learn these things as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to bring Imogen back in. Uh, Imogen, someone in the um, participant chat box has asked a question, pointed out that these are all part of what's called body focused repetitive behaviours, yep. um, which is terminology I hadn't heard before. But the question was actually around does the same kind of treatment approach, is it applicable to the, the different manifestations of body focus repetitive behaviours? Yeah, absolutely. So we're learning a little bit more about these body focus repetitive behaviours. Um, for example, skin picking disorder um, as of 2013 has been recognised as I guess an official obsessive compulsive related disorder alongside TRIC in the DSM-5. So, um, and the, the diagnostic criteria um, are actually identical for both of those conditions. They just replace the words hair pulling with skin picking. So uh, we are learning more and more that there are a huge um, symptom-based similarities among these conditions, but also we think that the, um, the emotion regulation mechanisms that might be underlying these disorders um, are also quite similar too. So um, Johanna mentioned before um, this idea of conceptualising these problems as, as ways of coping um, with stress and, and emotion and life, much in the same way that you know excessive um, eating or exercising or gambling can also be ways of, of regulating your emotions. So so can um, BFRBs like hair pulling and skin picking. And so. Um, you know, the research that is emerging for skin picking as well 
Um, again, it's habit reversal therapy and you can enhance it with um, cognitive therapies like um, ACT for that as well. Yeah. And actually, I'll keep you on. While we're just talking about the evidence-based therapies, there's been a couple of questions about specific kinds of therapy. So there was quite a lot of questions at the registration around um, hypnotherapy. And mm. then this evening, there's also been some questions about sensory strategies and occupational mm. therapy. So I wonder if, yep. if you could comment on, on those two. Mm. So to my knowledge, um, I don't believe there is much published in the way of hypnotherapy um, as an evidence-based treatment for um, hair pulling or, or even skin picking. Um, although, yeah, clients of mine have seen hypnotherapists and, and have found varying success with that. Um, in terms of like the sensory based approaches, um, this is something that I um, incorporate into um, treatments as well. So using that kind of SCAMP acronym again. If you're finding that for this particular individual that you're working with, there's a really strong sensory component that's driving that behaviour. So, um, you know, they associate that tension or stress or anxiety that might drive the hair pulling with particular physical sensations and they really get strong desire or, or I guess pleasure or gratification from the sensory experiences like um, you know noticing how coarse the hair feels or how smooth it feels or um, you know the color that sort of thing then you can find ways you know working collaboratively again finding ways of you know are there other textures um, that might give you a similarly pleasurable sensation um, but without relying on the hair to give you that sensation. And again, that's where an OT might come in as really helpful, yeah. And I think it's really interesting to me that the, the detailed behavioural analysis that you're taking to be able to actually yeah. know exactly what it is that's, um, that's helping this person, even down to the texture of the hair. So you, mm. you must get really used to talking about things that people actually um, have felt very ashamed about. And I, I'm assuming that that safe place where they can talk about it in detail is in itself part of the therapy. Mm. Yeah. I think it's it's like, you know, what most practitioners are already doing is just taking a, a curious, non-judgmental approach to understanding um, the way that people feel and behave. And, and hair pulling is just yet another behaviour. Um, yet another coping strategy and so just sort of you know I think I want to impress upon um, you know people attending tonight that you've probably already got the skills to work with people with hair pulling and even skin picking problems um, it's just focused on a different behavior thanks Imogen I'd like to invite George back in George um, we've had a couple of questions when we were speaking before I've just called you George again they're going to sack me. Scott, I'm very sorry about this. I've I'll get to ring you up and chastise you. I have to concentrate more on what I'm doing. I'm trying to read questions at the same time. Um, so, Scott, the question I, we spoke earlier about um, young people and even children who might develop this. And for some of them, it's just something that pops up for a while and then goes away and it's not really a problem. Um, and then someone's raised a question about are there any, sometimes things like ADHD meds, this clinician has seen them make something like this worse. So I wonder if, if, you, if you come across that and also whether, whether you have any particular different approaches if you're working with younger children. Um, I know there have been some case reports of stimulants um, increasing these sort of behaviours. Um, but I don't think it's been looked into much more than that. Um, look, I, I probably should declare here that I, I don't actually treat kids. I usually um, see their parents who are telling me about their children, and that uh, and and again in, in 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 people with anxiety and OCD and you know trichotillomania, um, parents are, are are very aware. Usually because they the diagnosis was missed in, in their own situation. Um, and you know, we used to see people presenting, you know, 10, sometimes 20 years after they'd the condition had started. And you know, those parents obviously are, you know, very, you know, they're very focused and they're if anything, maybe a little too sensitive to their kid developing 
these symptoms, so they're right onto it when, when it happens. And um, I, I do have um, a number of child psychiatrists and, and um, clinical psychologists who work with kids who, who I've um, got some links with and we share referrals and so that's normally what happens in those situations. Um, but as I said, usually um, we're waiting a little bit early on just to see whether this becomes uh, an issue or whether it becomes, you know, um, combined with something else. Um, and, you know, usually, I mean, the, the things that I worry about mainly in kids are social anxiety because this is something that, that precedes, you know, a lot of OCD and all of these things to a large extent and often doesn't improve. Um, so if you've got a kid who's very, very, very anxious and socially anxious in, in you know, kindergarten or early primary school, you know, that's something that we really need to get onto quick smart. And in that case, if you're working with the parents, if it's the parents coming to see you, are you able to use the similar kind of approaches with the parents as the therapist almost? Um, do you mean treating their kids or...? Yeah. Um, look, usually in those situations I'd be focusing on the psycho -ed side of things and, uh, and I'd be giving them stuff to read, I'd be um, asking them to, um, you know, perhaps to or look into a little bit of that first, the first part of Imogen's approach, um, which is really trying to work out when it happens, where it happens, what's the circumstance, that sort of stuff. Um, and you, look, you can, on occasion, you know, give some some suggestions. You know, just simple things like um, presenting a barrier. You know, so one of the things that we try to do sometimes is get people, you know, to increase their awareness of their pulling, particularly with that automatic version. And one of the ideas might be just to put a band-aid round round the the kids uh, or the person's uh, pulling fingers, so that they become aware of when they're doing it, so that they they pick it up a bit more quickly. Um, so, but I I don't think I I don't actually get into specific therapy really. It's, that, that needs to be done. Um, by someone focusing on the kids specifically, and and you've got all sorts of issues with, um, you know, not so much confidentiality, but to some extent that sort of stuff. If you're treating people in the same family, and um, you know, there are circumstances where that has to happen, and I guess we're thinking particularly of regional circumstances where there might only be one psychiatrist or psychologist around who has to think about what they're going to do in that circumstance. Um, for me, I'm, I'm happily able to uh, refer off. Thank you. But it's really practical and helpful. Um, someone else had asked about um, family systems therapy, and I, I guess that there are situations where um, addressing the issues in the dynamics of the family is going to help the child as well. But I'm imagining that there isn't specific evidence for um, family systems therapy and TRIC. It I don't. I think there is. Imogen will know more about this because she's obviously done all the research recently. Um, my guess is, I mean, the thing about systems therapy and family therapy is that they, they almost certainly wouldn't be focusing specifically on the hair pulling. They'd be focusing on the issues with communication, the issues with, um, you know, the kids' sort of relationships and, you know, more uh, sort of, you know, system-oriented stuff. So while they would probably talk about the hair pulling, I doubt they would be delving into the sort of the specifics that we're talking about here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Now I'd like to invite um, Joe back in and I know that we were talking um, before about about shame and about how if someone came to you, you know, especially if they've held on to something like this for years and then they um, feel safe to talk to you. I know you have an interest in something called self-compassion and I wonder how you might, if we go back to Hannah um, as a 26 year old, how you might actually talk about that with her um, to help yeah, her I was, with Yeah, I was feelings. interested, I was interested if there was already any documented um, uh, information on that, for, you know, with specifically to, for trichotillomania, but from my perspective as a generalist, I guess I'm sensing with Hannah there's some forms of sort of self-rejection, ignoring maybe, and it could even be worse than that where she's maybe having some self-loathing that's mixed in with shame. And so um, I found the kind of framework of self-compassion a helpful way to think about how we relate to ourselves. Um, there are other 
more, you know, more sophisticated family um, therapy-based systems like internal family systems that do similar work where we sort of think about how we, what sort of relationship we have to ourselves and um, whether that relationship is one where when we're distressed we can be of use to you, we can be helpful to ourselves or whether we actually increase the distress. Um, so some of what we've been talking about, a little bit about today where we normalize it and they're not the only one in the world who does this, that's part of the self-compassion framework is to sort of think of yourself as part of the common humanity and that your experience, your internal experiences that are leading to trichotillomania are part of that um, as it's, and it decreases that sense of shame and isolation uh, that you sort of belong to a, a group of people that uh, you know other human beings feel like this too. And then there's the aspects of can you be towards yourself as compassionate as you sometimes are to others? And um, and so there's, there's processes um, in, in this way of seeing that about helping the person to have affection towards them themselves. I, I love the work from uh, Russell Mears of the conversational model where he talks about tender reflective attention towards ourselves. And, and you know, I sometimes use that word and the word tenderness is so, um, so uh, you know, beautiful in terms of us thinking about how we relate to ourselves. And doing something that we later regret is not tender. Um, doing something that hurts us or makes us ashamed is not tender. And so, you know, and it's a reflective pay, way of paying attention to ourselves. Um, so that's probably enough said for me on that. But just, just thinking that the way that Hannah's relating to herself maybe is being enacted in her body um, and that instead of getting tied up completely in what she's doing with her hands or her hair, I'm, I want to focus on the relational aspect of what's going on as well. Thanks, Joe. And I'd like to bring Imogen back in just to comment a little further on a the question about um, children and young people and also whether there's any other kind of um, emerging therapies that we haven't really addressed yet that you think um, would be helpful for people to know about. I think it's really interesting that we're getting a lot of questions and comments around um, yeah, things like family therapies and um, self-compassion focused therapy. So in the research literature, to my knowledge, this hasn't been um, investigated as, you know, say, evidence-based treatments. But um, I really agree with Johanna that we should be taking quite a holistic approach to, to working with our clients um, with trichotillomania as you would with, you know, working holistically um, and, you know, person focused with all of our clients irrespective of what sort of conditions um, or concerns they bring to us. So um, I think this, you know, when we're working with children, it is um, important to, to understand what's happening within the family um, and we know that our hair pulling and, and skin picking and BFRBs, they, they run in families. Um, it's, you know, like everything with the biopsychosocial models to how we understand psychological conditions. Um, there's a genetic com component, yes, but then there's also like a learned component. So, you know, we want to know how else do people in the family um, hold their anxiety or manage stress or respond to difficult emotions or express or inhibit anger and um, what do they do with frustration and boredom, that sort of thing. So, you know, for, for children and, and adolescents, could they be picking up on some of these um, experiences within, you know, their families? Um, and likewise with the self-compassion therapy, um, again, no research evidence, but I think it's, it's not too far removed really from some of the, the notions that come through in ACT-based treatments anyway. Um, this idea of you know focusing on your values and and meaning in life and um, you know what makes life worth living and fulfilling, um, which can actually be um, quite nice for helping people with trick to reframe themselves as not just their appearance or not just their hair or not just their lack of control um, over their hair pulling behaviours, but they're actually you know their their whole being is comp composed of so much more than that. Um, so I think it, it, you know, it's certainly something um, that I think more research should focus on in terms of these self-compassion folks, focused therapies. 
um, and reflect some of the themes that were coming through in, in my research as well with that sense of self. Um, you know, the, the shame and the low self-esteem um, and the belief that they're abnormal or abhorrent or strange in some way, um, I found was not just in relation to the comorbid depression. So this isn't just the influence of depression occurring here. This is, you know, these are themes and, and beliefs um, that are specific to trichotillomania as well. So we need to be addressing them more in our treatments, I think. And do you know, somebody was asking about, you know, you're talking about um, emotion regulation and um, running in mm -hmm. families and things like that. Sometimes, you know, shame's often associated with people who've had traumatic experience as well. Do you know if there's any um, evidence about the use of EMDR therapy for this kind of thing? Yeah, so um, again, none that I've come across in the research literature. Um, but yeah, it could be an interesting one for, for future studies to explore. Um, yeah, quite commonly there can be a trauma history um, for people with trichotillomania, but it's no higher than in other um, disorders like you know anxiety, depression, eating disorders, that sort of thing. So um, trauma can be a factor, but it's not the only explaining variable. Yeah, and before I let you go, this is a very practical question. Um, somebody's asking about is there a particular issue about the root of the hair? I'm, I'm guessing that yeah. there might be different things for different people, but this person has just noticed that often children seem to like the root of the hair, even if it's mum's yeah. hair. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So um, yes, this is something that I've noticed with my clients as well. Um, in some ways, I like to think of hair pulling as mindfulness gone wrong. So what my clients are very skilled at doing is paying attention to very, very minute details of their hair, um, like sensations that you and I just, you know, don't even notice. Um, people with trick often, you know, uh, really pay attention to every aspect of detail of, of the hair follicle, the hair root, the hair shaft, like just all of it. Um, the oils, the smell, the taste, the texture. Um, yeah, it's really, really detailed. And so this can be one way of, I guess, leveraging a skill that they already have. They already know how to engage in some of these mindfulness and, and attention-based um, skills in, in regulating emotion that we use. But we can flip that and reframe this skill to be used for um, more adaptive emotion regulation purposes. Um, which can be helpful for some people who, you know, they hear the word mindfulness and they go, oh, no, it's just, I'm not doing it. No, I've tried it before, it's ridiculous. Um, or, or don't want to engage in that kind of, um, yeah, experiencing your emotions. Um, they've got the skill, just need to learn how to apply it in a different context and for a different purpose. Thank you. Now, I had another question for Scott, a couple actually. Um, just back to the small children, and you mentioned in your um, presentation that it sometimes appears in kids and then they grow out of it. So there was a question from someone about how long would you leave that before you um, considered whether, before you sought help. So if you, if you had like a toddler or a young child who was pulling their hair, at what point would you consider that you might need to get some professional help for that? Um, I think probably when it starts, I mean this is going to sound a bit um, basic, but when it becomes a problem really. Um, so if it becomes sort of, um, if the, if the kid, kid is spending a lot of time doing it, um, if it's um, becoming an issue sort of within the family or at school, um, I don't think there's, there's no sort of definitive um, answer to that question. So I think uh, it's really when it becomes sort of um, a, a problem. I mean, one of the things that um, a lot of um, people with trick become quite skilled at, at hiding their hair pulling. Um, now, kids won't, may not be quite as devious, but I'd imagine that some could be, particularly sort of young teens and the like, and they'll pull from areas that are not immediately visible, um, and so it might sort of remain hidden for quite some time. So, you know. Kids can sometimes, or people can sometimes pull from behind their ear, um, which isn't sort of immediately visible. Um, and 
you know, occasionally, you know, some pulling of, of eyebrows and lashes obviously is, is sort of acceptable. Um, so, yeah, as I said, no, no definitive answer to that, that question really. And look, it probably was a bit of a um, mean question to just drop on you with no warning. Um, I do have a question which I think does have more a researched answer. So there's a, a substance called N-acetylcysteine or NAC which yep. I understand has some perhaps preliminary evidence of being effective and probably doesn't have a lot of side effects. So I wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, look, um, NAC um, has been around for a while. I mean, there, there, was, a, uh, there was a study um, done in the US uh, almost 10 years ago, actually, um, and that showed benefit in about half the people who used it. And, but on a fairly substantial dose, um, I think it was 2,400 milligrams um, per day. Um, that I don't, I, I don't think that's been replicated. Um, although there have been a, a number of case histories um, subsequently that show it to be helpful. Um, we've been doing uh, in Melbourne. We've been doing some work with OCD patients um, with NAC. Um, and we've done a preliminary report that is suggests it's somewhat helpful. We're doing a much larger study now with studies in Brisbane and Melbourne and Sydney as well. Um, I don't know what, whether this is going to prove to be particularly helpful or not. Um, in OCD, we're doing it. Uh, we're only doing it in addition to an SSRI, uh, so an antidepressant as well. Um, and I'd have to look up that study done in the US with with trigetillomania to see if it was the same. Um, it, it, it has an advantage in that it is um, essentially without side effects. Um, the disadvantage is that it's not PBS and therefore it has to be bought essentially over the counter and it's not so widely available and so therefore it can be uh, in some cases relatively expensive. Um, there is a capsule form, I think 600 milligrams, but you have to take uh, four or five or even more of those per day. Uh, we think the effective dose for OCD is about 3,000 milligrams, so that's five of those capsules. Okay. Um, there are so some. Watch this space. Sorry. Watch this space. Yeah, there are some chemists that, have, that will sell you a powder, which is a lot cheaper. Um, yeah. Although you have to be a little bit careful. I had a patient who who wanted to take his powder overseas and I said, look, perhaps not to Malaysia. That probably wouldn't be a great <laughs> idea to go into the country with a, with a big bag of white powder. So he, he decided to, to, to cease his meds uh, for that period of time. <laughs> That's wise. And I just had one general question for you about the success of treatment of trichotillomania. So we do know what some of the evidence-based treatments are. How successful are they as a broad? Look, Question. It, it, this is always, um, and I'm sure Imogen will, will sort of um, back me up here. I mean, this is always one of the dilemmas that we have is that the, the studies tend to focus on a group of people who are fairly sort of um, limits, that they have, they have, say, the specific condition, but they don't have too many comorbidities. And so perhaps this group responds a bit better to the treatment. Um, in comparison to real life and real practice. Um, and it is a big issue. One of the people we were talking before about people um, rarely seeing this. Um, part of the issue is that, again, people don't have a lot of confidence that we have a treatment for it yet. And the other thing is the treatment is, excuse me, very bloody difficult. It's really hard to do this work. And that, you know people drop out a lot. So, uh, if you can get people to stay with you and do the work, they nearly all make improvements without necessarily getting rid of the problem. Um, but uh, you know, it is the, one of the big issues is is people who come along for a few sessions and then they realise what they're going to need to do. And you know, this may be partly me not explaining it properly, but I don't think it's all that. I think part of it is that you know, the idea for some of them that they're going to have to resist this urge. Um, is you know they they don't think they can do it. Okay, thank you Rick, very much for that, Scott. It will come back to you shortly. We're just approaching the end of the webinar, and so I'm going to invite everyone to come back in with their take-home messages. And I'd first of all like to start with Joe. 
Yes, thank you, Mary. Um, I guess my uh, take-home message as a generalist is that complexity is our friend in the case of Hannah, um, that there's so many things I can see in her story that where little small changes might make a difference to her life experience um, and that might decrease the kind of dominance of her pair pulling as a coping style. Um, so I, I see in a case like this that as a GP I might get tempted to get really focused on her behaviour um, to the exclusion of some of the other things that matter for her. Um, and so I, I think there's lots of ways we can help her in her day-to-day -day life, in her relationships, in her relationship to herself, um, in her having more fun, more play, um, more interest, more sense of purpose and where she's going. And she may, I really sense that she needs somebody to help her talk through the relational things that might have happened when she was 14 and when she, in her recent relationship breakdown, there's a sense of something of a very private pain for her and loneliness, I guess, I sense in her. Um, and so my, my goal really is what, what can we do to comfort her in all the different areas of her life um, so that she doesn't need that pulling as much. Um, all of her matters and um, I'm, I'm, I, I've got a real sense of affection towards Hannah and a little, little a sense of hope of what might come if she was able to face the things that make her want to hide. Thank you. And um, I'm going to invite Imogen back in. Before I do, I just want to acknowledge that we've had many, many questions tonight and haven't been able to get through them all. So I really apologise to those in the audience who haven't had their questions answered. But I think we've covered an enormous amount of material. Imogen, I wondered if there were any things that you would like to say and leave us with as we finish up. Oh, yes. Um, I suppose uh, just emphasising that um, a conducting a really comprehensive functional analysis of this behaviour is quite important. Um, the more you understand the factors at every stage of the hair pulling cycle that contributes to the urges and the actual behaviour, the more you and your client can work together to figure out what particular strategies can we try at this time to help me cope with those urges or to help me distract myself or to help me um, yeah, do something else um, useful. Um, and it's a bit of a trial and, and error approach really. So um, psychoeducation, preparing our clients, as Scott was saying, to expect that um, a problem that lasts for, that's lasted for 10 years won't be treated in 10 sessions. Um, so scaling back those expectations for, um, you know, progress and, you know, cure. Um, that's not to say that the treatments that we might use with people won't be effective, but that change is hard. It's really hard work, but it is possible. Um, you know, helping clients to see that they're more than their trichotillomania, they're more than their hair loss, might be one way of, I guess, uh, preventing some of the, um, the the challenges to motivation when it feels like nothing's improving. Um, and um, yeah, and I guess realizing that. Um, you probably already have the skills necessary to work with people with trichotillomania. Um, curiosity, non-judgment, compassion, um, understanding classical and operant conditioning principles, your CBT, your ACT, you already know these things and you can work with, with people with trichotillomania. So yes, yeah, certainly not to shy away. Thanks very much Imogen. And last but not least, I would definitely like to invite Scott back in and once again with an apology for the wrong name earlier. Um, Scott, is there a, anything that you would like to um, finish up with? Yeah, look, one point really and that is that there is, there is, as Imogen said, there is lots of hope here. I mean, the most people with this condition and a whole range of other important um, anxiety and OCD conditions over time actually the vast majority of them actually make progress and get a lot better. Now they may not get 100% well but they certainly get better and you know we need to think about this. I mean part of the problem with, with my practice and with a lot of practices is that the people who get better they, they disappear because they're good and they don't want to come back and see the shrink. Um, the people who, who, and so we tend to get a somewhat pessimistic view about things but in fact you know, the vast majority of people 
um, get benefit even if it isn't um, if, even if it isn't cure. That's it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Look, it's just been such an interesting discussion tonight. I've learnt so much myself, and I know that the participants have as well, judging by the chat box. Just before we go, I'd like to remind everyone to complete the survey feedback. Um, it really helps MHPN um, think about webinar topics for the future. So the survey feedback tab is at the top of your screen. Uh, that will open a survey. Your certificate of attendance will be emailed to you within four weeks and you will all also be emailed a link to the online resources associated with the webinar within two weeks and you'll get a notice when it's um, up online for people to be watching it on the podcast if they'd like to. Um, Remembering also that MHPN have a system of local networks. You might find it really helpful to join with other um, interdisciplinary practitioners in your location. And then there are um, more national webinars coming up. And um, there are also some online networks around specific topics. So if you're new to MHPN, I encourage you to have a really good look around the website. Uh, and once again, remember to give us feedback. And thank you all so much for contributing uh, in the chat box and for our panellists tonight for your contributions. Good evening. Thank you.